Thank you for joining us. My name is Marielle Villaray. I'm the Program Development Director for the Office of Academic Initiatives and Strategic Innovation at the Graduate Center. And we're so pleased to be partnering with Copeland House on this series of virtual programs that we call Underscored. And this week, we bring back Pierre Jalbert, the composer who is featured in today's program and who will be in conversation with Michael Bariskin following the performance. You can submit your questions for that conversation at any time throughout today's program. Use the Q&A button at the bottom register of your Zoom window to submit those questions and impressions to be brought into the conversation. Thank you for joining us. I'm going to hand it off to Michael Bariskin, Artistic and Executive Director of Copeland House to tell us more. We'll see you soon. Welcome to the living room in Aaron Copeland's longtime home in New York's lower Hudson Valley. Today we are returning to a composer we featured here on our Underscored series back in January, Pierre Jalbert. We've actually had a more than 20 year relationship with Pierre who first came to our attention in 1999 when he applied for a Copeland House Residency Award as an up and coming 32 year old composer. And by the way, he was indeed one of that year's winners. Uh, one of the pieces he submitted with that application was the very composition we're featuring today, his piano trio, which he had just completed the year before in 1998. It totally bowled over our jury, and our Music from Copeland House Ensemble immediately made plans to program this stunning, stunning work. It was the very first work of Pierre's that we performed, and we ended up giving its New York premiere at Merkin Hall in Manhattan, where it was acclaimed immediately by the American Record Guide as a masterpiece. It was only the first of many performances Music from Copeland House gave of the work, and we included it on a CD we made a few years ago of four of Pierre's chamber works. It was also only the first of many pieces of Pierre's that we've been performing all across the U.S. over the years. The trio is in two very contrasting movements. Uh, the first is called Life Cycle and is propulsive, gritty, wide-ranging, and at times almost primal. And the second is called Agnus Dei, which is that portion of the Latin Mass that's about the cleansing of life's sins and asking for redemption. And that music is meditative and chant-like and ends up literally ascending higher and higher into an otherworldly serenity. So is this piece about life and death or life and redemption? Before we hear music from Copeland House perform it, let's talk to Pierre and find out. Hey Pierre, it's good to have you back. Glad to be back. Um, I'm struck by how you've affixed a completely abstract title that is basically the name of the, the medium the genre, Piano Trio, to a piece whose two parts are called Life Cycle and Agnus Dei from the Latin Mass. And so I'm wondering if um, it's reading too much into that, or it's too grandiose to think that this piece may somehow be referencing life and death or life and redemption. What, no, it what do we think? Yeah, it absolutely does. Even though it has this abstract title, the it's really the individual movements that bring out these, these various aspects um and i mean this 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 piece has its beginnings in sort of many places you know uh, as a pianist um and as a student i played the beethoven opus 111 sonata the which is last two, the, the last. last of the beethoven uh you know the um, late period 
Beethoven, a sonata in two movements where you have this sort of intense, blistering first movement leading to this angelic C major second movement set of variations. And, you know, there aren't a whole lot of two movement structures out there. So that kind of intrigued me. And my piece, the, the trio is in two movements. Um, so it was kind of modeled after that, although it doesn't sound like it in any, any particular way. Um, and you have this, and, and another sort of inspiration was at the time uh, was the birth of my first son and hearing his heartbeat for the first time. And my wife looked and I looked at each other when we heard his heartbeat for the first time. And I said, quarter equals 176. <laughs> <laughs> and that's exactly the tempo of the first movement. Now, what, what struck me about it is it was really fast, you know, this really fast heartbeat. And um, so the first movement is called Life Cycle. And the it sort of has these four sections in which section four repeats section one. They're all at this same tempo, but they're very different. Um, all are kind of rhythmic and intense. The third section is kind of jazzy and funk in a way, funky. Um, uh, it sort of takes from, I, me I remember distinctly at the time watching this documentary on James Brown and his theory of the funk and the where beat one is a huge strong beat and everything that comes after that is syncopated so that was kind of modeled after that as well so it has all of these various different kinds of things in it and then the second movement agnus dei um at the time mother Teresa passed away just had passed away and this movement was sort of uh, inspired by her and um, like the Beethoven, it has this sort of angelic C major ending, but everything before that is, is uh, outside of that key and much more um, pensive and dissonant and but it all sort of leads leads there. Um, and I thought, okay, that's, I don't need a third movement. This is the, these are the two pillars of the piece. And that seemed, that seemed good enough to me. And actually my second piano trio, which came much later, uh, I, I, again, I used the two movement form, but I did the opposite. The, the sort of slow lyrical uh, movement came first and then the fast, sort of intense rhythmic stuff came after. Well, it is pretty hard to imagine uh, what kind of music could come after the second movement of the piano trio, which really does seem to ascend to really a very special place. Uh, seemingly a place maybe not quite of this world and of real serenity. And, um, you know, this is, as a performer, I and my various colleagues who have played this piece as we have so many, many, many times and recorded it over the years uh, have never really felt, oh, well, you know, this is not quite complete. We wish there was something something that follows. I mean, these two movements are, seem to be so, so encompassing. I know very well that in describing your own music, uh, you've often spoken about your music sort of occupying the space between these two polarities um, of secular, and sacred, and obviously we, you know, we've touched on it here, where the secular is this kind of visceral, propulsive music, and the sacred is serene and and meditative. Um, the piano trio is an extreme. It's an early example of that, and it's an extreme example of that. So, can you just 
talk a little bit about how that's you know how you came to that and and how your music does sort of reference that yeah well it was a way of uh well first of all it just came it just sort of came natural you know it sort of developed that way it came became both kinds of ways of thinking about music became a part of my dna uh, as a composer but um I think it was a way of creating contrasts, you know, um, and there are certainly other aspects to my music too now, I think, but then it was, I think, a way of um, providing the listener with both propulsive music that where you do feel the pulse, you know, and has a um, sort of rhythmic, intense gesture to it versus more timeless kinds of um, music where, and I've always been interested in that too, that the nature of time and, and I'm always telling my students, you know, as composers, we try to control time. Um, that's what that's what we have to do, or we choose to do sometimes at least, um, with some composers at least. And I've always been jealous of painters <laughs> who have total control over a canvas. And once it's done, somebody could come up and look at it for five seconds, or they could look at it for five hours and uh, you know, those are different experiences, but it's that painting. Whereas with music, if you really want to get to the end, <laughs> you have to stay there for the whole piece. So, you know, we're manipulators of time and this sense of timelessness um, and the suspension of time has always interested me. Um, so that sort of led me to these two extremes uh, I guess early on in, in my composing. And since then, I've certainly carried that on, but hopefully I've, I have some other, uh, um, other aspects of my music that are a little more in between. <laughs> I, I think you do. And I think you've, you've certainly uh, provided um, a really extraordinary roadmap in this piece of music for the listeners. Um, and um, we're going to turn to the performance now. Uh, it is really quite an extraordinary piece. Music from Copeland House has performed this piece, uh, as I said before, lots. And uh, it's always a great experience. Uh, we hope you all enjoy it. Um, happily, uh, Pierre will be back uh, after uh, our performance. So please stay with us um, and um, use the handy Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. We will try to take as many questions as we can following the performance in which I am joined by my two wonderful colleagues, Kurt Mackember and Tom Cranus. Um, we will see you soon. Pierre, thanks for joining Thank us now. It's always great to talk to you. Enjoy the work um, and we will see you soon.